Well, my name is Sophie Meunier, and um, I'm the co-director of the European Union program at Princeton. And it's uh, my really immense pleasure and uh, great honor to welcome my compatriot, Pascal Lamy, uh, today to the Woodrow Wilson School. You all probably know that Mr. Lamy served as director general of the World Trade Organization from 2005 until just two months ago when he finished his second term there. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit briefly about the interesting career trajectory that led him there. Mr. Lamy is a graduate of HEC, Sciences Po Paris and LENA in France, and he began his career as a French civil servant uh, in Treasury, and then he was a technical advisor to Jacques Delors, who was then the Minister of the Economy and Finance under Socialist President uh, François Mitterrand, and then he was also the Chief of Staff for Prime Minister Pierre Monroy. When Jacques Delors became President of the European Commission in 1984, Mr. Lamy joined him in Brussels and served as his uh, chef de cabinet for the whole time, uh, time which many consider now to be the heydays of the European Commission. After Delors completed his two successful terms there, um, Mr. Lamy came back to France to work for Crédit Lyonnais, where he was in charge of preparing the bank's privatization. And in 1999, Pascal Lamy returned to the European Commission, this time as a commissioner, the Commissioner for Trade under the presidency of uh, Prodi, Romano Prodi until 2004. And it's during these years as trade commissioner that he started to develop and implement this concept of managed globalization or harnessed globalization, um, which he also tried to put in practice during his years um, at the helm of the WTO. Now that he's freshly off, retired from the WTO, Pascal Ami is for the moment back in Paris, where he's the honorary president of the think tank Notre Europe Jacques Delors Institute, which is an independent think tank on European integration. He's been pretty busy writing too. Um, he just um, chaired the commission that came up with this report from the Oxford Martin School, now for the long term. He has a book on the Geneva Consensus and Trade coming out next month from uh, Cambridge University Press. And he's also very busy writing a book on France and globalization, which should be done next year. So let me just finish this brief introduction by making three, which I think are impressive points about uh, Pascal Lamy. The first one, and this is not, this is not polite flattery, um, all of us here, and there are many of us who know uh, Pascal, um, you will find from all of us unanimous praise that he's one of the sharpest analysts that there is about the benefits, but also the pitfalls of globalization. Second impressive point, and I'll let you make your, pass your own judgment on that, is that uh, Pascal Lamy is not a politician. And the third point is that he is here, and we were lucky to have, here, to have him here because he just came to New York to run his 12th New York City Marathon. <laughs> so, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, Sophie, for this uh, introduction, for the uh, invitation. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm, I'm okay, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm getting a bit old, but I still can run marathons. So a few more years of uh, trying to be uh, useful, including in uh, discussing these uh, issues that have to do with uh, globalization, its uh, governance. Uh, which I will focus my uh, remarks uh, on uh, and trying to leave uh, enough time for interaction. Uh, globalization, I think we will uh, all agree on that, is uh, the big uh, transformation at uh, work in our times. Uh, and I've been lucky enough to be uh, connected uh, with uh, this process at uh, national, European, uh, global level uh, during the sort of 20 or 30 years uh, during which it has uh, taken this uh, huge uh, speed it has uh, now. Now, in human history, uh, 
this uh, phase of globalization is not uh, unprecedented. Uh, we've had other waves of uh, sorts of globalization. Uh, usually when uh, uh, there was a technological jump in uh, the way you transport uh, people, uh, goods, uh, or uh, information. There have been several phases in history uh, when uh, you started uh, being able to cross the Atlantic uh, uh, with uh, sailing boats, uh, when they moved from uh, sail to steam, and this had a huge impact on relative uh, prices. Uh, of course, with the invention of uh, electricity, and uh, nowadays uh, with uh, IT uh, development, each time what matters is that these uh, technological jumps shrink uh, the cost of distance, which traditionally uh, was a, a limit to uh, the expansion of uh, international uh, exchange. Again, whether this is for goods, whether this is for people, whether this is for services. This time, nevertheless, uh, is very specific. Uh, there has been no previous example of uh, a wave of globalization uh, that is really global, uh, sort of finite uh, planet, uh, that has this speed and that has uh, this uh, force. So in many ways, uh, it's totally unprecedented uh, by, again, size, uh, force, uh, speed uh, of, of the phenomenon. And with uh, impact uh, outcomes, uh, which uh, we know, and Sophie just uh, mentioned that, uh, are both uh, uh, extremely positive and uh, extremely negative. Uh, there are obvious positive uh, results of uh, market capitalism uh, working uh, much more efficiently than in the past, with uh, notably uh, international uh, specialization, uh, which is a huge uh, efficiency uh, provider, creator, hence a uh, lifting uh, of the boat in terms of uh, cost of living, uh, cost of exceeding to goods and services for uh, many people in this planet, uh, a sort of a snowball of a consumer producer, which is what led to this the development, who wrote an uh, excellent book about the rate rebalancing. All these, all these approaches lead to the same thing. The international system, uh, for the moment, is not up to uh, the challenge of addressing a number of these uh, important uh, global uh, issues. And what I'd like to do now in the remaining uh, five or ten minutes is just have a look at uh, what are the options to address uh, this uh, global uh, governance uh, deficit. How could we be better at uh, addressing uh, these uh, challenges? And on this, I'll take a very uh, simplified uh, sort of categorization of uh, possible uh, avenues. Uh, one is the sort of very classical, traditional uh, Westphalian approach based on roughly 2,000 uh, sovereign nation states uh, behaving between themselves as uh, individuals and entering uh, or not into uh, contractual uh, obligations, uh, the name of which for uh, lawyers is uh, treaties. Uh, then uh, there is another approach which is, uh, I would call, neo-Westphalian, which doesn't question the basic theory of this Westphalian sovereignty of the nation state based uh, international system. Uh, then there is one uh, avenue which is uh, post-Westphalian, which is uh, 
a single uh, case, which is the uh, European experience. And then uh, there is a fourth category, which uh, I think is appearing, and which we've, uh, uh, we've uh, uh, described in quite a bit of detail, although that wasn't the real purpose of this report of the Oxford Martin School, which I uh, chaired with a worldwide commission of uh, formidable uh, personalities, uh, which is a sort of a Westphalian. So starting uh, with the Westphalian uh, approach, the traditional one, uh, 1648, uh, we decide that uh, wars uh, should not be uh, based on uh, religious uh, motivations, but for state and then national motivations. Uh, so sovereigns uh, are uh, the, the international system is composed of sovereign molecules which are free to enter or not into, uh, as I said, contractual obligations. Uh, hence, a number of rules, a number of disciplines, a number of principles, uh, use Kogans, uh, the creation of uh, international organizations uh, with the waves that uh, small wave before the First World War, a big wave after the First World War, even bigger wave after the Second World War. Uh, but all these international organizations are uh, based on the same principle that uh, they are uh, established uh, and driven by uh, sovereign nation states. They're all member driven, including, uh, including the, the UN, of course. So that's the classical approach. Uh, uh, very based on, again, the notion that there has to be a rule of law among nations as there is a rule of law among individuals uh, in, a, in, a, in a human uh, community or collectivity. Uh, the problem, of course, being that uh, agreeing on what the proper uh, rule of law is uh, is uh, pretty tough huh? because people... These 200 countries are uh, totally diverse in size, in levels of development, in uh, ideological, spiritual, cultural approaches to problems, and getting to something uh, which is convergent is uh, incredibly difficult. And by the way, the only moments where this Westphalian system uh, really moved forward uh, were uh, moments uh, post-apocalypse, uh, and notably uh, the First World War and the Second World War. <coughs> if you look at the history, if you, if you look at the graph of when these steps were taken, it was always after a major uh, uh, catastrophe uh, plus uh, genocide, uh, and even, you know, the, the, the latest of these, of these institutions. I mean, the, the first one in the row was the, uh, uh, the uh, International uh, Telegraphic Union, which was created, if I remember, in, 16, uh, in 1860. Uh, the last one was the uh, International Criminal Court, uh, which was uh, created in 1998, after many, many years of uh, debate on responsibility to protect, possibility to intervene, uh, in a state uh, when there is a civil war or a genocide. But that, that option is there. It's slow, painful, uh, and uh, again, subject uh, to uh, 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 this formidable diversity, which the development of many countries which were underdeveloped uh, is making even more complex, of course, because the number of people uh, who have their say around the table, legitimately, uh, is much bigger than it was when the world was run by, you know, a few club, a club of a few, a few rich countries. Now, then there is the sort of uh, neo-Westphalian, which doesn't question this notion that a nation state remains sovereign. And the main reason why there is a case for believing that the system remains the primary one is not because they're sovereign. It's because they are legitimately established systems of power. So in many ways, the, the Westphalian system defined them as sovereign, 
But then this sovereignty was inhabited by nationalism, by the creation of nation, and then nation states, which is the real matrix of political legitimacy. Uh, and when people say, uh, you know, all politics are local, with a sort of condensed sentence, oh, what a pity that all politics are local. If it wasn't the case, the world would be a better place. I totally disagree with that. I'm fine with all politics being local, because this is, for me, a fundamental political principle that you know, power has to be with the people. Uh, so it's, it's not the sovereignty which is a real blockage, it's the legitimacy. And legitimacy is a direct function of, a, of a proximity. Uh, there is a total correlation between legitimacy and proximity. The further the power, the less legitimate the power will be. And inevitably, in a global planet, uh, uh, you need to have some of this. But, but this cannot be the sort of mainstream of addressing the issue. Now, on the neo-Westphalian side, you've got uh, Washington, uh, the boss of the Financial Times, you can wonder the media side to be in it. What we've been doing is looking for the last 10 or 20 or 30 years at a set of these global issues uh, and uh, trying to understand uh, what work, work, why what work worked and why what didn't work didn't work. And a number of these issues did work reasonably well. I mean, HIV AIDS, for instance, has been reasonably addressed. Not fully, there remain uh, many problems, but as compared to the size of the challenges and as compared to the first moment where uh, uh, people tried to address it, the result is uh, reasonably okay. Uh, something like Y2K, for instance, uh, which was this uh, uh, adjustment of uh, IT systems to the uh, year 2000, which was a major problem for many people, was properly addressed. I mean, the uh, Montreal Protocol on the uh, uh, chlorofluor of, uh, of carbon uh, was a reasonably successful uh, environmental uh, achievement uh, for, uh, for the planet. Now, on the other side, we know that uh, uh, ocean uh, depletion uh, is still going on, that environmental negotiations uh, are uh, stalled, uh, that uh, uh, financial global regulation attempts before the 08 crisis uh, all fail. Uh, so there are examples of success, examples of failure, and what we did was not make a judgment, but we analytic an analytically uh, looked at uh, why did what work work, and, and then we draw a number of conclusions, and this leads me to this sort of a Westphalian approach. For instance, uh, <coughs> and what they have in common in terms of global governance or you know, how to harness globalization, which is basically addressing the challenges which are uh, described in the report, uh, one of the big lessons is that uh, you have to uh, move out from the monopoly <coughs> of the, <coughs> sorry, uh, which the Westphalian system establishes in saying international relations are the matter of sovereign nation states. There are other global players today than nation states. There are multinationals. There are uh, global NGOs. And by the way, many of them have become uh, global uh, more rapidly <laughs> and advertise themselves as uh, come with us because we are global uh, for a variety of reasons that works uh, extremely well. So one of the lessons is uh, let's try and address a number of these issues with uh, new more creative coalitions. And for instance we suggest in the report that climate change instead of, uh, of uh, pedaling uh, uh, eternally uh, within the UNFCC, uh, be addressed by a coalition of 20 countries, 30 multinationals, uh, 40 cities. Uh, and one of the big findings of this report is that in terms of global governance, uh, cities are becoming a major actor and their, their capacity to go global and to interact between cities without a sort of old tradition of you know, 
needing diplomats uh, to talk to each other, because if you don't do that with a diplomat, you're never safe. Most major cities pick up their phone uh, and phone their colleague, and whether it's about garbage collection or uh, carbon emissions or public transport or, or health systems, uh, if they want to do something together or compare notes or benchmark each other, you don't need at all this uh, formidably thick uh, bureaucratic uh, system, uh, which I've uh, called uh, in private uh, diplocracy, and which I think is one of, the, one of the major problems of the way this Westphalian system works. So there are avenues in there. Uh, if you uh, read the report, you'll find other ideas which are a bit uh, provocative, like the idea that uh, each international institution uh, should uh, have a review clause uh, that regularly uh, should oblige uh, its members, these uh, sovereign Westphalian animals, to re-establish them, uh, re-check uh, the relevance of their uh, mandate, uh, the size of their mandate, the content of their mandate, re-look at how they are staffed, resourced, uh, because there is an obvious uh, problem uh, of uh, not doing this uh, in uh, many uh, interstices of the international system. So I'm, I'm not going to detail all these proposals. Just to say that this is, uh, this is one of the new approaches which I think uh, deserves consideration. Of course, lawyers, uh, uh, specialists of uh, public law or of international relations, uh, usually prefer to look at institutions, uh, treaties, you know, it's written, uh, it's referenced, you can find it, it's stable, uh, there are statutes, constitutions. This a Westphalian approach is much more messy in many ways, it's much more pragmatic, it doesn't always show, it just happens, it's more difficult to spot, to describe, but I never think that uh, it's worth uh, having a careful look at this. And, and my final point uh, is that, uh, I mean, from what I've seen and practiced in the system, the, the solution probably lies in some sort of combination of these various approaches, uh, including uh, 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 regional integration, not the EU way. Uh, the EU way is so specific that I don't think it will uh, happen this way uh, anywhere else. But if you look at Asia, if you look at Africa, uh, there are uh, elements of semi-global governance, let's say mini-global governance in African sub-regional integration. And the Eastern African region, for instance, is doing extremely well in terms of economic and political integration, at least as compared to other uh, African sub, uh, uh, subcontinental uh, integration processes. If you look at Latin America, Central America is doing quite well. Uh, Mercosur uh, is uh, clearly in a, in a phase of a regression as compared to what it was uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Same for the uh, CARICOM uh, Caribbean uh, integration. Uh, so it's not all going in, in, in the plus direction. ASEAN is, uh, for instance, doing uh, extremely well. So that's also one of the ways to mix these uh, various approaches. And my uh, encouragement to... Uh, place like this would be to uh, not stop looking at the traditional approach uh, to global governance, because it will remain uh, extremely important, but start looking at these new things that are appearing and that may be, in many ways, more efficient, thanks to, notably, uh, technology, uh, social uh, networks, uh, uh, the whole sort of internet world that inevitably is a formidable uh, connecting advantage, which wasn't there uh, uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, and I deeply think that if you combine these new technological development with new thinking about how to proceed, uh, a number of the pitfalls, uh, bottlenecks, uh, problems we've, uh, we've had uh, in the recent years on global governance uh, could be uh, overcome, and that's uh, at least what I'll keep trying to do for some time. Thanks.